Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome and thank you for joining us here with GMAT Club. Uh, as we progress through this, I hope you're going to have a lot of fun with this. I hope you're going to find out some very interesting information. Um, and I'm looking forward to it. I hope you are too. I'd like to start just by asking a question. And the question is pretty basic. About to show it on the screen right now. If you can see my screen, please let me know in the chat. And particularly, please let me know if you can see my screen by answering this question. You could also feel free to just pop in the chat any questions that you have about the GMAT itself as they come up. Okay, a few A's, some D's, some C's. Beautiful. So, again, how the GMAT works. How is it scored? How does the scoring algorithm work? What is it testing? Something which may seem a little bit unusual, how to learn with a few try this examples. What I am most excited about today is if we're all here to break 700, we'd want to know with as real examples as possible how that's done. So what I did a few days ago, I took a, an official practice test on the MBA.com website, one of the free practice tests, and pulled a few questions from that practice test to show you today as representative examples of what's happening on this test and how we could build plans to score within the 700s. And then we'll close several portions of our lesson with building takeaways, the process of what do we record about our work and efforts in a productive fashion. So first and foremost, how it works. There are a few options for the test. The first is start with the essay and integrated reasoning, then you take the quant section, then you take the verbal section with corresponding eight minute breaks in between. Again, assuming this is all normal timing. If you have timing accommodations, some of these numbers will be slightly different. There's never any reason to do choice one. Just don't. Uh, starting off with an hour's worth of essay, integrated reasoning, etc. Just a bad idea. So don't do that. Choose choice two or choice three. If you are the type of person who likes to have a bit of a warm up set before starting something like this, you can absolutely do that. You choose five problems from the official guide to build your warm up set and you do that before you walk into the test center. But you would never start with the essay or integrated reasoning. Start with quant or start with verbal. Now, as for which, generally, you would want to start with whichever one you're stronger in. The test is scored based on number of points. And number of points is pretty direct. They take the points from the quant, the points from the verbal, they add them up, and that, roughly speaking, translates to your score. So your goal is very basic. Get as many points as you can, so you'd want to start with your strongest section. Now, this is one where I do want a response. You have two people, student one, student two. Which one receives the higher score? Student one tracks by difficulty level and achieves very high ratings, 
but tails off at the end. Student two never reaches the highs that student two achieved, but also does not tail off at the end. Who gets the higher score? And while you're contemplating that, please take a moment to remember to like or dislike this video if you are enjoying this information and finding it helpful. Also, one quick reminder, this is a GMAT Club event. Uh, subscribing to their events gets you some free stuff at GMAT Club. You might want to check that out. Majority twos, a few ones. Student two gets the higher score, which is intriguing. Why would the test reward the test taker who is more consistent but never reaches the very high levels. The way I look at it is this. The GMAT is about minimizing losses. Everyone is going to miss questions. It does not matter what level you score at, everyone is going to miss questions. The trick is you don't want all of your misses to come clustered together. That's where the algorithm hurts you. And so we want to make sure that our misses, when they happen, are not disastrous for overall performance. The main way the algorithm enforces this is through timing. The algorithm's decision metric for poor timing is a string of wrong questions at the end. And so a string of wrong questions at the end is a signal to the scoring algorithm that you did not manage your time well, henceforth you did not perform well in the test, and it hurts you. This test is not actually about knowledge. It's about performance across time, and it's about managing your decisions. Let's play a game. Let's play this out as the computer in real time. The computer starts. At each question number, it's going to choose a difficulty rating for us. And when it starts, it knows nothing about us. So will the computer start at a low, middle, or high difficulty rating? I'd like to see responses in the chat to that too, please. Low, middle, or high. Where does the computer start us? Ankit and Fareed are on it. It starts us in the middle. The test scores by differentiating every test taker from all the other test takers. And it wants each successive question to provide as much differentiation between you and other test takers as it possibly can. And it moves that metric accordingly. So it begins by starting in the middle because no matter whether you get it right or wrong, that will provide a pretty substantial differentiation between you and other test takers. So we get question one correct. Now it knows we need to be in the upper half. Will it be in the low, middle, or upper portion of the upper half? Where will the next one land? It will again land us in the middle portion of the upper half. Because it is still trying to differentiate us from other test takers. It's trying to differentiate you from the other people in the upper half. So it wants to know comparing you against other people in the upper half, right or wrong, I want to achieve a lot of differentiation. So let's say we get the second one right. And now it knows we are in the upper quarter. You may be sensing a pattern here. Will it go to the low, middle, or upper portion of the upper quarter?
Upper quarter, low, middle, or upper portion for the third question. Looks like Ankit says upper, Shailesh says low. This is where it gets interesting. Or at least I find it interesting. That next question is going to be the hardest question the computer has. It will be an absolute utter nightmare. Now, if you think about that for a few moments, you may realize that does not make sense. It's a wasted question. You're going to get it wrong. I'm going to get it wrong. Everyone taking the test is going to get the hardest questions wrong. That third question does not provide us with any differentiation. We get it wrong and we look the same as every other person taking the test. So why? Why does it waste this question? We need to be mindful of the fact that the computer algorithm has a few usually complementary goals, but at the beginning those goals can conflict, especially if you are a person who will score in the 700s. If you are a person who will score in the 700s, these goals will conflict at the beginning. The computer wants to begin estimating an appropriate difficulty level for you. It defines appropriate difficulty level as where you miss the questions almost half the time. The scoring algorithm functions best when test takers have 60 to 55% accuracy on the questions. So the computer is looking to generate that, 60 to 55% accuracy. At the same time, it's trying to differentiate us from other test takers. It's trying to find the level at which we miss those questions. And at the beginning, those two goals can become very contradictory for the scoring algorithm. On the one hand, it wants to give you harder questions. But on the other hand, it needs to see some right and some wrong. And so at the beginning, it can become vastly imbalanced in number right versus number wrong, and the computer starts freaking out. At the moment, the computer sees two right and zero wrong. You are, mathematically speaking, infinitely far removed from the algorithm's desired accuracy. And the computer does not like that. And so it will give you monstrously difficult questions until it starts to get you to miss some. Arca, there is always a 20% possibility of getting it right. That is a fascinating point. So let's assume for the moment that just by random chance, because it is a one out of five shot, just by random chance, we do get this third question correct. What does it do to our score? And I'd be intrigued. Can anyone in the chat respond in one word? Getting this third highest difficulty question correct. What does this do for our score? Can you respond in one word in the chat? So I was far. Nothing. It does nothing for us. The people who designed the scoring algorithm are very aware that there is an inherent flaw in any multiple choice test. You can get questions correct just because of dumb luck. And so they built a correction for that into the algorithm. The algorithm takes one, maybe two, but usually one of the most difficult questions that you got correct and it throws it away. Now that sounds evil, 
but it is fair because it does the same on the other end as well. It takes one, maybe two, but usually just one of the lowest difficulty questions that you got wrong, and it throws that away as well. And it says that is our correction factor for dumb luck. For the times that you got a question correct, even though you knew what you were, you did not know what you were doing. And a correction factor for the times that you would have missed a question, even though you did know what you were doing. Now, what does this mean for us as test takers? When you hit those monstrously, ungodly, awful questions, you do not spend time on them. This test is about decision making. It's about knowing where to allocate the only resource that you control time. It's less often, can I do the problem? And more often, should I do the problem? It's not about academics. It's not about how much algebra you know. It's not even about how much grammar you know, if you're thinking the verbal side. It is about your ability to look at a problem in a given context and say, I can assess this information. I can understand the prompts based on patterns that I've seen before and based on my own prior work inside this field. Although this will be a similar problem to things I've seen before, it will never be the same problem, so I will need to be able to adjust. I will need to be able to find creative, maybe not out of the box, but on the edge of the box solutions. A few questions coming in here. How many can we get this type of question which is non-graded? It is less that it is not graded and more that it is considered an outlier. And it will be one. That's the best bet. One high question that will be considered an outlier one low question that will be considered an outlier. There are experimental questions on the actual test. When you pay the fee to take the test, part of the fee you pay is paying for the privilege to beta test future tests for them. This is where the scoring algorithm builds. This is how they know what difficulty ratings to assign to each problem. And you'll get around five of those in each section. The deciding factor between doubling down and working through a problem and deciding it's just not worth it. There are no hard and fast rules for that. But there are trends. You will need to develop your own. I can tell you some of mine. If it is an accept question in verbal, or a Roman numeral style question in quantitative. And those of you who have studied a little bit, you have probably come across some of these. If you have not studied, you have not come across these yet, you will. If any of you are thinking Yoda from Empire Strikes Back right now, you will be, of course. Sorry. You have to wonder about the cost-benefit analysis of any question which indicates you have to answer this question multiple times over to get credit for it once. And in essence, that is what any accept question and any Roman numeral question is asking you to do. So those formats, I need to think carefully before getting into those. On the quantitative side, geometry. If it's more than three shapes, I need to think carefully about getting into that. If I'm looking at a problem and I have this feeling that I wish I had an Excel macro that I could build to solve this problem because there are so that many different equations involved, I need to get out. There is no one deciding factor. And your deciding factors will ultimately not be identical to mine. That's why this test is so fascinating. It's about finding ways to leverage your own strengths while minimizing your weaknesses. You will find out which questions are worth it for you and which questions are not worth it for you. And on the test, you must 
stick to those decisions. Josh, how do you know that you're scoring well in recognizing the difficulty of the question? You don't. We need to be very, very aware that difficulty rating and difficulty to solve are very different things. Difficulty to solve is about how challenging is it to correctly arrive at the one single answer. Difficulty rating is not always the same thing. It's a multiple choice test and it's engineered in such a way that some questions that are very difficult to solve would not have a terribly high difficulty rating because when you look at the five answer choices, some of the answer choices are more intuitively not reasonable. And so even though there are theoretically five answer choices in front of you, only two are reasonable. And in those instances, there would be many people who may not be able to solve the problem, but still have a 50-50 chance of getting it correct. There are many examples of questions that are very, very difficult to solve, but don't have the highest difficulty rating because the answer choices were constructed in such a way that if you think for a moment, instead of jumping into a traditional approach, you may recognize that some of them aren't reasonable. After how many questions can the cat determine the score range? Around 10 to 12 if we were perfect test takers. And by perfect test takers, I don't mean answered every question correctly. I mean, if it was beyond our ability, got it wrong. If it was in our within our ability, got it correct. We are not perfect test takers, and the computer needs around 30 to correct for that imperfectness. Ankit, so yeah, so what you're seeing is a quant of 48 with almost all of your questions landing at a very high difficulty level. Can we know how many questions you can get wrong in a particular section for a 700 score? I would say a fairly reliable estimate would be around seven to 10, a little bit more maybe, but that's not really the way the scoring algorithm works because if those wrongs are questions that have a low difficulty rating, you won't get the score that you want. You always want to end strongly. And the GMAT does not use any other sources for your scores or your level other than the official test when you are sitting in the test center. The last point is one of the ones that I find most fascinating. Be willing to change your mind. Always be willing to walk away. Always have the ability to make the decision of, I started this, but this is much worse and much more expensive than I originally thought it was going to be, and it is not worth it. So, learning. Preparing for this thing. The first is you must differentiate between practice and study. Practice is developing your test taking skills that can be applied under the time constraints of the actual test. Studying is developing those test taking skills outside of timed attempts. Time yourself, you pick an answer when you need to. And you make the decision you would need to make on the real thing. And that will occasionally be the decision of, I don't, I cannot do this. I need to get out. 
learn to get better, try it again, and perhaps more importantly, determine if it's worth getting better at a particular thing. Analyze all the possible components that you can from a problem, and then build a repeatable, applicable lesson from the problems you attempt. What was in this problem that I expect will be replicated in other problems, and how do I deal with that? <laughs> Samir, why are the Manhattan prep mock tests so difficult? Oh, thank you very much. I would be fascinating if we did likes and dislikes right now of people who've taken who are in here. If you've taken the Manhattan prep test, or if you've heard this. Why are the Manhattan, and I'm a Manhattan prep instructor, of course, since the logo on the bottom right of the screen, <laughs> why are they so difficult? Samir, it's because of how they're built. Um, we take official source questions and we chop them up into little pieces and we mix and match pieces from two or three different questions and mold those into one of our questions. And it's in that molding from two or three different questions into one question that inevitably the questions we build have more mechanical steps to them. And so they do end up feeling more difficult. It's an, a necessary outcome of the most reliable way to build practice tests. And I kind of like it because I do believe in the theory of if you plan for the worst, all surprises are pleasant. So, <laughs> Stuvik's on it. <laughs> if you're sitting there going, this is hard, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. So, a quick thought experiment before we see an actual problem. We are about to see an actual problem from an official free practice test. If the GMAT presents you with this type of information, R divided by S is less than zero, and S divided by T is greater than zero. What are you thinking? What is your action plan or your recognition plan for this type of information? Oh, and Ankit, yes, we absolutely do. There will be a link attached to this video, if not right now, sometime in the near future, uh, sending you to some options to try some Manhattan Prep resources for free. And again, I would submit to you that GMAT Club also has some excellent free resources as well. Same signs and opposite signs. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. So when I see inequalities against zero, I will think, what are the sign relationships? Fantastic. Now, Manish, I would urge you to take a moment and think about your response. Would you know which of the two is negative and which of the two is positive for R versus S? And a similar question for S and T. They have the same signs. Are S and T negative negative or are S and T positive positive? <laughs> Vikna, that's one way it could go. Kirill, is the Manhattan Prep CAT algorithm different from the official GMAT CAT algorithm? There are inevitably some differences because GMAC does not allow anyone to actually see their algorithm. However, the I believe his job title was Chief Psychometrician, which I love because that's when you know they're just making stuff up. The Chief Psychometrician, who was the head of the team developing the official algorithm for the actual GMAT, 
we have invited him to look at our algorithm and he has stated that it is the closest that he's seen to the actual thing. And now is the point where we try. I am going to take a few moments Uh, Subiki, yeah, I think I think the name I think the person's name is Larry. I don't have a personal relationship with them, but yeah. Please take pen to pencil. Take a few moments. Give this question a try. Please note that this is from an official practice exam. It's one of the free sets. It's from a practice exam that I actually took. Take a few moments. Give it a try. Okay. You may not be done yet. If you're not done yet, that's okay. We look at these problems and we always want to say process first. Is the median greater than the average? I know X must be an integer and I have this set. Well, process first. You have a set of questions. Perhaps it might be a good idea to order that set. You have 1, 3, 8, 12, and x is sort of off to the side somewhere. And so one of the first questions would be, where does x exist? Is the median greater than the average? Well, as it stands right now, if I were just looking at this four number set, what would be the median? Between three and eight, as it stands right now, your median would be 5.5. .5. And we wanna know whether that would be greater than the average. At the moment, my average is 12 plus 8 is 20, 23, 24, 24 divided by 5 is 6. At the moment, the answer is no. But I'm still wondering, where is x? If I look at statement 1, an x must be greater than 6. Let's see what we have. 1, 3, Greater than six, let's try seven, because it must be an integer, eight and 12. 
In this instance, my median would be 7. My average now. Twenty thirty-one thirty-one divided by five would be just a touch above six. So as it is now, the median there would be greater than the average. What do I do next? X must be greater than 6. We've tried X7. <laughs> oh, what if X1, 3, 8, 12, 100? Median is 8. The average is, I don't know, but it is massive. And now the answer to the question is no. Which means statement one is not sufficient on its own. We look at statement two. X is greater than the median. If X must be greater than the median, that tells me that X must be to the right of eight. If X is here, X would be the median. That cannot happen. That tells me that x must be either the fourth or fifth number in the set. So I have to go 1, 3, 8. And then I have, what if x is 9? What if x is 12? Or the other thing is 12. Now your median is 8. Your average would be 29, 32, 33 over 5, which is around 6.6. .6. Is the median greater than the average? Yes. Oh, but now we run into the same problem as a moment ago. What if X is 1,000? And there your answer is no. Not sufficient. Do we need to combine them? Here's where we need to make sure we play into logic. <clears throat> if x is greater than the median, x was already going to be greater than 6. Even combined, you would still end up with the yes and no cases that you had for statement 2. And so we land on E. Now I'm really curious about something. What would you say is the difficulty rating for this problem? Satvik, why can't x be the median? Statement 2 tells me that. Statement 2 tells me x must be larger than the median. If you're looking at the statements, the statements must be facts. I'm seeing some responses that they would suggest that this question is around the middle level of difficulty. What I can tell you is this question is from an official practice test where I was taking it trying to simulate someone who would reliably score in the 700s, but not necessarily achieve a perfect score. Um, so I overshot the mark a little bit. I was shooting for around a 730 or 740, ended up with a 780. This quant section had a quant score of 50. And this question was well into the quant section. So this question would have a very high difficulty rating. And yet, by your responses, it seems that none of you were thinking it would be that difficult. Difficulty rating is not the same thing as actual difficulty to solve. Difficulty rating is built around the best way to build questions where you can make mistakes. Now we study. When I see a number set and I see statistic, yeah, 
statistics terms? What is my actionable response? What do I think? What do I do? Vijithoran, you are in good company on that one. A lot of you will be getting hit with cancellations there. Wheeling, yeah, you could look at this and say a number set and statistics question means I want to spend a good amount of time analyzing. I would submit that one of the first things I'd want to do, I want to see the set in order. Just a core process idea. And it seems so basic. Of course I would do this. But plan it. Have it written down. Everything about this test is I want to have precise plans that are flexible. When I see inequality signs or inequality language, is the median greater than the average? X must be greater than 6. X must be greater than the median. When I see inequalities, a good thing is to say, I would like to test extremes. I might need to think integers versus non-integers. This is how we prepare ourselves to score 700s on the test. We take questions and we look for patterns. For example, Avinash, the unit's digit for 66 to the 5th minus 5 to the 55th would be 1. Because unit's digits follow patterns. Anything with a 6 as a unit's digit is going to keep a 6 as a unit's digit. Anything with a 5 as a unit's digit is going to keep the 5 as a unit's digit. And so you will ultimately be subtracting unit's digits of 6 minus unit's digit of 5. <laughs> Anyways, we have a few moments left here. Let me skip ahead for a moment. Because I do want to make sure we see one verbal question as well. Everyone take a few moments. Give this problem a try. Oh, Sarvishvar. Nice catch. That's a nice little bit of evilness there. Try this problem. People are getting some answers in. I would like to respond to a question I saw in the chat window a while ago about the question types that pop up most often. Generally speaking, on the quant side, statistics questions pop up very, very often. Questions that deal with exponents and exponents, exponent relationships, especially as mixed with inequalities, show very often. Uh, fraction and percent relationships show up very often. 
Other things do, up, do not show up nearly as much. As an example, a units digit question would be very, very, very rare. And I hope everybody's amused by the tricks involved in that units digit question. We're all going to miss some. Um, on the verbal side, strengthen and weaken questions, along with some find the assumption questions, will be most common in critical reasoning. I would say reading comprehension inference questions would be most common, but that's kind of like saying the sky is blue. All reading comprehension questions are inference questions at the end of the day. Sentence correction questions, core sentence structure issues involving subject verb issues and punctuation, uh, parallelism, modifiers, those are the most common on sentence correction. Ankit, I'm very weak on verbal, practicing solely verbal till my exams. Please, I beg of you, make it 80-20 verbal quant or 70-30 verbal quant. You have no idea how often I've had people tell me, Chris, I took the exam again today and my score is pretty good, but my blank score dropped, usually verbal, but sometimes quant. And they'll say, why did this score drop? And I'll ask, well, when was the last time you practiced that section? And they'll say, oh, six weeks ago. I think I know why your score dropped and what was your stronger section. Pranjal, P and C, do you mean pronouns and comparisons? My brain was on sentence correction there. No problem, Ankit. What is the correct answer? Let's find out as we study. Assess everything. Where is my subject? Where is my verb? The new image have emerged. That's curious. That should not happen. I appear to have some parallelism going on as systematic hunters rather than merely scavenging. That's curious. From the examination of tools found in Germany, comma including now your comma ing style modifier, the comma participle style modifier, is merely, it, it merely adds more context to the main sentence. Some more description on how or why this new image has emerged from the examination of these tools. You have a that description describing the spears. Is it underlined? No. Will it impact the underline or any of the answer choices? No. Do I want to train my eye to notice this? Yes. So, Marth, what you're asking is, does the GMAT make its deciding factors based around idiomatic builds? And the answer is not usually. I wish I could say never, but I have to say not usually. What we'll see here, that as a walkthrough and we assess, where are my verbs? So that's gone. Where is my parallelism? As mere meat scavengers, mere scavengers of meat, mere scavengers of meat. Hunters versus scavengers, that is at least now entirely a noun to noun comparison or parallel set. That includes 
comma which includes comma including that includes includes a singular you are describing Germany comma which includes is includes is singular you are now describing Germany Germany includes three wooden spears In a weird sense, I'm certain that is a true statement. I'm certain that in the nation of Germany, there are three wooden spears somewhere. I'm also equally certain that is not what this sentence was trying to convey. And so we have one choice remaining. Are we done? Absolutely not. Examine everything, build your ability to find all the wrongs. Merely scavenging for meat, merely scavenging for meat. A and B have two wrongnesses. B would have a red, comma, which, well, would B be wrong? You take a look, you assess. Which include? Include is plural. That would be describing tools. The tools include three wooden spears. That, I believe, would have been correct. B is wrong for other reasons. But the comma which in B is not wrong. Is it a good idea to cramp up some common idioms in the last lap of preparation? Some are, I would not make that the biggest focus of my studies, but if you want to go that route, I can tell you, find a source of idioms that you believe is reliable. I, of course, would say Manhattan Prep has a list of idioms that's in our strategy guide. Um, you know, who am I and why am I here? Of course, you know, Manhattan Prep is going to be the top of my list. There are many reasons for that. What you want to study, if you study any idioms at all, are idioms which are listed with a form of word, dot, 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 word. Idioms that exist in two parts. Not only dot, 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 but also dot, dot, dot. As, dot, 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 as. Things like as much as, as little as. Those two-part idioms are not only idioms, they are also parallelism or comparison signals. And so if you were to study any, you would study those. Devong, why E? Because A, B, C, and D are wrong. C and D have broken modifiers. You do not want to describe the nation of Germany at the end of this sentence. You want to describe the tools or you want to describe the sentence itself. A and B have broken subject-verb relationships. You could not say the image have anything. Abu, the answer to that question is yes. Da -da -da. Difficulty level of this question. I can tell you that this question was well into the practice test where I scored a 48 on verbal. All right, my friends, if there's one thing I want you to remember from the two problems we looked at today, both problems I hope you're seeing as I want to build plans. I want to look at quantitative lessons and say, when I see this type of mathematical nomenclature or when I see this type of content area, here's what I put on my paper. Here's what I think. For sentence correction, as a microcosm of all verbal, what are the elements I know they test? And I want to be able to assess those elements everywhere I find them, even if I did not need them for this problem. For A and B, you did not need the parallelism issue. But you want to know how to deal with it because it will be key in future problems. Make every problem you attempt a source of planning for future problems. 
So I will stop that for the moment. All right, my friends, how many questions do we get roughly from each category in the verbal section? It's actually close to equal for all of them now. When they dropped the number of verbal questions from 41 to 36, uh, they actually, roughly speaking, made all three categories close to equal in terms of the number. So it's about, it's evenly divided into pretty close to thirds. Sentence correction, critical reasoning, and reading comprehension. I struggle with parallelism. Any tips to get better? better? Pranjal, my tip for parallelism would be to be very, very explicit about exactly what phrase signaled parallelism, whether it's the word and or a word or a phrase like not only blank, but also blank. And then be very, very explicit about what the items that are actually being set together. Do they exist? The aspect of parallelism is if you had two parentheses, A plus B, close parentheses, and my slide is down, so I can't draw that at the moment. But if you can picture that, if you had two parentheses, A plus B is a math problem. Hopefully, you would immediately distribute it. 2A plus 2B. Parallelism should work that way. You should be able to distribute elements of the sentence onto the parallel set. Is that Lord of the Rings in the back? Yes, it is. Lord of the Rings, some Douglas Adams, uh, some biographies, and other assorted assessments there. <laughs> I love having uh, one of my bookcases behind me just because it always pops up with some interesting questions of, hmm, is that really? What? Yeah. You also see, you also might see a copy of Dune back there. Other various things like that. How many verbal questions can go wrong to get a 730 considering quant of 49? Kalyan, I, that question is actually an impossible question. It's not about number wrong. It's about the difficulty rating for the wrongs. I will say that your overall scoring is built on the sum of the two subscores. 85 points combined between quant and verbal is somewhere between a 690 and 710. So if you want a 730, you want around 88 points, maybe 89. So what that tells you is you want to get a verbal score of 40. As for how many questions you get wrong and still get a verbal score of 40, <sighs> probably somewhere between 7 to 11 would be my guess. But that is incredibly flexible. I'm having to very much ballpark an estimate based on my experience seeing a lot of students test results in their practice tests and a lot of enhanced score reports. There's a wide array of flexibility there because difficulty rating of the question plays the most dominant role in your score. Huling, any tips to improve from a 650? I'd need to know your breakdown of quant and verbal to give you better advice on that. If your 650 was built off of a quant 48 and a verbal 33, you'd need to work on verbal. If it was something sort of the other way around, you'd need to work on quant. I'd need to see the breakdown there. Again, everyone, if you've had fun with this, throw us a like. If you don't like my book selection, throw us a dislike. Other than that, that is today's plan. I will stick around for a few minutes to wrap up any questions here, but I hope you've all had fun today. And um, good luck. Make sure you think of this as a long-term goal. Think of it as, I want to this test to showcase my ability to put a long-term plan together because earning a graduate degree is a multi-year task. Shreek, how can I get access to Manhattan GMAT tests? Uh, go to manhattanprep.com. 
manhattanprep.com slash GMAT. Am I a GMAT demigod? Demi demigod. Um, I am, to some extent, this is what I do for a living. GMAT, GRE, and LSAT, actually. Um, I live in the world of standardized tests. This is where I have fun. Verbal 33, quant 49. Arjun, you definitely want to grab some verbal points there. There's not much you can do more in quantitative. Quant caps at, four, at 51. <sighs> Avinash, one book for quant and verbal? I can suggest one for each, and that's a very basic thing. Manhattan Prep, Manhattan Prep publishes all the quant and all the verbal strategy guides. Where to study verbal section from basics. Uh, again, I would refer you to Manhattan Prep resources called Foundations of Verbal. Is seven years work experience a bit too much for MBA? I believe you are approaching, now I will tell you that this is getting out of my area of expertise. I can give you what I have been told. Seven years work experience is approaching the level where you would be looking to apply to executive MBAs, less than a traditional MBA. But you would want to talk to people about that. You would want to have some schools in mind, reach out to them. The people will be very responsive to those types of questions. My mock scores are varying widely. That is the usual culprit for widely varying scores is time management. What happens is you get very, very short on time towards the end of a section and you end up having to guess a lot. And in one test, you get lucky with your guesses and get close to half correct because you got very, very lucky. And in another test, the same situation, you end up crunched for time, but this time when you have to guess a lot at the end, you are not so lucky and you only get maybe one out of eight correct as opposed to three or four out of eight correct. And then you'll see scores vary widely a lot. Whew. Star Wars or Star Trek? Oh man, I'm gonna piss some people off with this. Got to go with the original movies, Star Wars, and the next generation, Star Trek. Those two, I would actually put at kind of similar levels to each other in terms of how much I love them for different reasons. How to improve performance in critical reasoning. Arun, remove the choices. Do not allow yourself to see the choices until you have written a prediction of what you think the test would say. Manhattan Prep Centers in India. I'm afraid our centers are in uh, New York and uh, San, uh, in Los Angeles, but we are very, very approachable through the internet, and we would love to get emails or phone calls. Sarveshvar, I have to travel to a new place to take my test, 300 kilometers from my location. Is there any way that you can stay overnight the night before the test where your test center is? That's what I would do if possible. Would I prefer official MBA practice tests from Manhattan? practice tests. If you're beginning your preparation, you would start with Manhattan because they offer far more detailed breakdowns of where you need work. The official practice tests give you a, a good snapshot into what test day will be like, but they do not provide you any kind of breakdown. They will not tell you, you missed more questions of this category. And so if your initial steps would be better off in Manhattan prep practice tests. Safik, you will be nervous. Don't try to deny it. I mean, it's good to see that you're acknowledging it. You will be nervous. That's okay. The important thing is to remember that 
the nervousness will be there, but nervousness does not change your fundamental abilities. 750, subject, get in there and take the test. You're ready. Do I have a list of plans for specific question types? I have a few broad strokes. Here are some core things that I always want to be able to put on my paper. It's usually built around being able to track change over time and pieces versus totals. Being able to work with data sets or function sets. That's on the quantitative side. On the verbal side, I want to be able to break down reading comprehension passages against with two primary competing points of view or two sort of X versus Y thoughts. That's about as much as I can give in like a, a 60 second response. How to ace time management. That one's a fun one. Learn to not do some problems. Write the letter G for guess at the top of your scratch paper. Write it down four times and scratch one of those letters off each time you look at a problem and say, no, I'm just not doing this. I'm going to make a guess inside 10 seconds and get out. If you have not burned four questions in each section, just saying, no, I'm not doing this problem, you're hurting yourself on your timing. Do we have blog posts related to study plans? Many, many, many. Manhattanprep.com slash GMAT slash blog. You'd be wanting to look for things written by Stacy and Kaylee would be two very good sources for that. How many questions wrong for quant 49? Seven-ish, seven to ten, probably. How many questions wrong allowed for verbal 40? Probably the same, actually. I mean, I'm afraid I'm not familiar with experts global cat algorithms. All right, my friends, that has been our time. I do need to go because we have some other things that need to happen today. And I will say just best of luck to you all again. Um, Manhattan Prep is around, GMAT Club is around. There are lots of free, re free resources around. Let's say go to some blogs, go to some forums, do a little bit of research. And again, make sure you think of this as a long-term thing. It's been a pleasure, everyone. Have a wonderful day and good luck.